Welcome to the Gambone Law Podcast, brought to you by Gambone Law, a Philadelphia-based criminal defense law firm. This weekly podcast is based on questions that we have received from clients and their families. Our law firm is committed to providing the highest level of professional service through aggressive advocacy and serving as a trusted advisor during a tough situation. To learn more about our law firm, read my weekly blog, watch my videos, or download one of my strategy books, visit GamboneLaw.com or call 215-755-9000, 24 hours a day, to schedule an appointment. This podcast is for information purposes only and does not establish an attorney-client relationship. Well, welcome to episode 13 of the Gambone Law Podcast. We continue to fight through the coronavirus epidemic that's gripping the entire country, our city, um, and all over the United States. Despite that, our firm is still operating. We are operating despite all these um, slowdowns and adjusting to the what hopefully is not the new normal uh, for too much longer. Uh, during this time, it's important to understand that uh, your attorney should be available uh, just like our firm is available uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, if anything, we have increased our accessibility to clients. We've made some upgrades to our website. You can now uh, call us um, through the website on your smartphone. You can also send us a text message uh, through the website, which is a great feature. Uh, I know that a lot of people more and more are sending text as opposed to calling or emailing. So to handle that, we have a, we have increased the accessibility of the website through that texting capability. And I'm encouraging you to visit our website, gambonelaw.com, to take a look at that. In addition, there's a new blog up there, as well as um, the previous podcast, uh, available online. When you go to the website, as always, there's there's books and downloads and a lot of information. So this coronavirus, I've been getting a lot of questions about accessibility to courts and how courts are going to deal with, with all of this. It's important to understand that just because this is happening in and around our country and things are shutting down, your case isn't over. So if you're charged with a crime, I can't stress enough to stay in contact with your lawyer. Do not ignore your case. Do not ignore your court date, even if there's a court date which you know is going to be postponed. Keep track of that case. Be aware of where it's going. Uh, stay in touch with your lawyer. The minute you lose contact uh, with your attorney or lose touch with your case, you're falling into the real possibility that your case will not end up in a good way. And what I mean by that is anything from a bench warrant to just simply upsetting the judge, and that's not a, that's that isn't a place that you want to be. While I've been in front of a lot of judges over the years, and I'll say that being late to court and missing court, it may not affect what ultimately happens, but it could, and, and it's always good to stay on the good side of a judge as opposed to the other side. So I just stress that, that if you have an active court date, uh, keep track of it. Uh, during this epidemic, if you are charged with a crime, be aware that you may not be arrested. And, that, and, and what I'm talking about there is there's been talk that Philadelphia and other counties aren't taking people into custody. Well, you are being arrested, you're being stopped, you're being detained, you're being cited, and you're, be give, and you're being given a court summons to appear at a later date. If you don't appear, they will issue a bench warrant for you. So please don't, don't think that because you're not being physically arrested, put in handcuffs, taken uh, into custody, held in a holding cell, that your case isn't serious and you couldn't face a substantial sentence if you were convicted. So, for instance, if you're charged with simple possession of a drug or a narcotic or you're charged with theft, those in uh, in many cases are misdemeanors. Um, simple possession of a drug in most cases is an ungraded misdemeanor offense. Uh, there are some drug charges which are considered summary offenses, but for the most part, they are ungraded misdemeanor offenses. Retail theft can be, for instance, a... a um, a summary offense, but in some cases it's a misdemeanor depend depending on the value. I just tell you that those are cases where you could face up to a year or two in jail. Not that you would ever receive a sentence like that, but again, it's more serious than getting a speeding ticket. Okay, so enough about that. Let's talk about our questions this week. I want to answer some client questions that have come in. 
Okay, so I was recently arrested on drug charges following a traffic stop where they found marijuana following a search of my car. The officer did not have a warrant. Was the search legal? He said he could do the search and didn't need a warrant because he smelled marijuana. I don't want to go to jail, and I've never been in trouble before. Well, like any drug case, it's important to take it step by step. So uh, where we begin all evaluation of drug cases is with the initial stop. So in the case of a vehicle stop, we want to establish whether or not there was probable cause to stop the vehicle. So in this question, I don't know why the stop occurred. Now, let's assume for a second that the person was speeding or had run a stop sign. Well, that in and of itself would give the, the police officer probable cause to initiate a traffic stop. So there has to be some traffic violation or a vehicle violation like a um, expired registration or a broken taillight of some sort, and that will give the officer probable cause to stop the car. Once that's done, the issue becomes, well, what gives the officer probable cause to search the car? So in this situation, the, the question revolves around the smell of marijuana. Now, it's important to understand that the smell in and of itself does not give the police officer probable cause to search a car. Now, they may not know that. So they may want to search the car anyway. My advice is let them search it. Don't give consent, but don't ever, ever stop the officer or try to get into some type of physical altercation with the officer because it's not going to help your case. And in fact, it probably will hurt your case because you'll be looking at additional charges in addition to what you could be charged with. So in a case of like this... If this individual had somehow stopped the officer, he could be charged with resisting arrest or something like an aggravated assault. Because remember, any contact with a police officer where bodily injury is caused, and bodily injury is defined very broadly, is considered an aggravated assault, felony of the second degree in Pennsylvania, and much more serious than a misdemeanor charge. So going back to this question, you have to understand that the smell of marijuana doesn't establish probable cause, but it does give the officer reasonable suspicion. So you have to keep in mind that reasonable suspicion is a lower form of probable cause, but the officer may not search a car with reasonable suspicion needs probable cause. So the search done simply on the smell of marijuana alone, in many cases, will be deemed to be illegal, and thus the evidence found is inadmissible. Now, what the smell does do, it allows the officer to establish that initial reasonable suspicion. It allows him or her to employ the use of a drug dog, which the officer in this case should have done. Now, there are other factors that could play into this. You have to understand that there's no bright line rule with regards to issues like probable cause. Courts in Pennsylvania and New Jersey will evaluate probable cause based on what's called a totality of the circumstances analysis. So looking at everything. So sights, smells, sounds, um, obviously something in plain view. So in this situation, if the marijuana or a pill bottle of some sort or some type of paraphernalia was in plain view, that would change the scenario. And the officer at that point would have probable cause to search, to initiate a search. But in this situation, I'm not sure if he even has that. Uh, in Pennsylvania and New Jersey, they don't need a warrant, but they need probable cause. So the search, the search of a car is different than the search of a home. Just keep that in mind. The expectation of privacy in a car is much less than that in a home. Keep in mind that you have less of an expectation of privacy in a vehicle than you do in your home. The home has the highest level of privacy, and because it's the highest expectation of privacy, it's the highest level of constitutional protection. Okay. Um, last part of the question, I don't want to go to jail. Well, again, I, it seems like this person is charged with simple drug possession. And in most situations, you aren't going to go to jail. And if it's your first offense, you may be entitled to several diversionary programs, whether it be in Philadelphia, in one of the counties like Montgomery, Delaware, Chester, Bucks, all counties that our law firm regularly practices in. Also in New Jersey, there's several programs that perhaps you could you could qualify for things like PTI, uh, conditional discharges are all possibly on the table. And those are definitely issues that you should discuss with your, with your lawyer. I don't think jail is a real possibility here. If the person is charged with additional uh, charges such as you know, 
possession with intent to deliver, well, that's a felony charge. And now jail could be a possibility. But, but again, those are all important it, it, those are all important considerations that your attorney should discuss with you. And I can't stress it enough that there's a substantial difference between possession and possession tend to distribute. They need more than just a substantial amount of drugs to make that charge stick. Keep that in mind. It's, um, it's, it should factor into your attorney's analysis when, when looking at your case. Okay, next question. My brother is currently in county jail on a probation violation detainer. He was arrested for a DUI and was on probation for retail theft after he tried to steal an iPad from the Apple store. Um, I am concerned with the outbreak of COVID-19 and getting him infected while in custody. Courts are closed anywhere. Uh, I'm sorry, courts are closed everywhere. Is there anything that we can do to get him out? Well, yes, there is. Uh, while courts are closed, they are open for emergency hearings. So some of those emergency hearings are bail petitions, motions to lift detainers based on changed circumstances like this COVID-19 virus. So an attorney can submit a motion to lift the detainer to get your brother out of custody. Now, it doesn't mean that this case goes away and that the probation violation hearing won't occur at a later date. It just means that you won't have to sit in jail and wait for the hearing. And right now I'm being told as of today, courts, at least in Philadelphia County, could be closed up until April 6th. Um, it could be longer. I mean, some people have told me that it could be June. I don't think that's the case. Uh, but again, all this is going to delay court proceedings. So in this situation, an attorney can file a motion to lift a detainer and basically in that motion explain to the court that based on the circumstances, based on what's happening in our country, based on the case law and precedent and really what's in the statute with regards to holding a person in custody prior to trial, prior to a hearing, all that being taken into account, the court should release the person because they're not a flight risk, not a danger to the community. Um, that's important to keep in mind. I don't know what your brother's criminal history is. It sounds like it's nonviolent. He was on probation for retail theft, which could be a felony charge here. I'm not sure what the iPad was worth, but uh, theft charges, the gradation of them is based on uh, the value of the item taken, and in some cases, what was taken. So theft of a car is always a felony. Theft of a, of a firearm is a felony. When it comes to actual items, then we get into value, or the, uh, whether or not this is the person's first offense. So I don't know that here. I, I'm assuming that, that the iPad is worth you know, at least $500 or so. So it's probably a misdemeanor charge. It may, uh, so in which case, uh, he could be on probation for one or two years. I'm not sure. But again, uh, he is eligible for release. Remember that a probation detainer was lodged because he was charged with DUI. He wasn't convicted of it. Now, people think that you have to be convicted to have a probation violation. You don't. Uh, you can be arrested and the charges can be dismissed on a technicality and still have a violation. Now, a lot of courts won't find a violation. Obviously, if you're if you're found not guilty, but many DUI cases are one on pretrial motions to suppress evidence, in other words, technicalities like illegal search and seizure, something that made the evidence inadmissible. So it's kind of a gray area. Uh, the condition of probation or parole is arrest free, you've been arrested, you violated. Remember, when it comes to a detainer, and a violation, there are two types of detainer violations. There's a technical violation, which is failing to, report, uh, failing to report to your parole officer or testing positive on a drug screen. And there's a direct violation, which is what this is. It's a new arrest. So all important points, if you have a detainer and you're worried about CO, uh, COVID-19, your attorney can file a motion to lift the detainer, whether or not it's granted, will be based on your prior criminal history, what you're being charged with, and, other, and those other factors I just stated. Uh, flight risk, danger to the community are all important. Okay, uh, I'm concerned that the COVID-19 will lead to a spike in crime. I've even purchased a gun. I've heard something about the Castle Doctrine. What is it? And what does it cover? Well, the Castle Doctrine is basically your right to self-defense in your home. 
Uh, in Pennsylvania recently, as of 2011, uh, the legislature has expanded the coverage of the castle doctrine to include places outside the home, like your vehicle. In the past, you had a, there, there was a presumption that if you uh, acted in self-defense in your home, um, it was reasonable. Now, um, that presumption has been expanded outside of the home, so it's actually now you have almost the same rights you have outside of the home that you have inside the home in Pennsylvania. That's kind of a gray area, but the important thing is to understand that the right to self-defense is very strong in Pennsylvania. When you assert the right to self-defense in Pennsylvania, it falls upon the prosecution to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that uh, you weren't acting in self-defense. So it's a very powerful defense to assert. Um, if a person is convicted of, of, a, of a crime, a crime of violence, take murder, for example, or if they're charged with murder and they make a self-defense argument, it's possible that that murder charge could become manslaughter uh, or maybe even an acquittal. Um, it, would, it would become manslaughter in the sense that you um, made a self-defense argument, but the jury or judge found that it was imperfect self-defense. That's another word for manslaughter, imperfect self-defense, that the jury did not find <clears throat> beyond a reasonable doubt that um, you acted in self-defense. So that happens in many cases. But again, you are well within your rights in Pennsylvania to defend yourself if you believe that your life is being threatened or someone else's life is being threatened. Um, you are within your rights to defend yourself and again, if you're going to own a gun in Pennsylvania, be aware that the right to purchase, there's no license requirement in Pennsylvania, unlike New Jersey, but a permit to carry is different. So you can buy a gun, you can keep it in your house or place of business, but you cannot carry it on the streets without a permit to carry, a concealed carry permit. If you do that and you carry it without a license, it is a crime. It can be a misdemeanor crime. In many cases, it's a felony crime, especially in large cities like Philadelphia. So just keep that in mind. Uh, it's very important. Um, the, the argument that I didn't know is not a defense argument. It's just a mitigation argument. Okay, next question. My husband just pled guilty and was sentenced to three to six years for a gun charge. I talked to a friend who told me the police officer who arrested him was recently disciplined for planning evidence in another case and has apparently done it in other cases. I want him to take back his plea and go to trial. I know he could beat this case with this evidence. Well, it's important to understand that in this situation, I don't know a lot. I don't know if it was a negotiated guilty plea or it was an open guilty plea. Obviously, the learning that a police officer was planning evidence is definitely an issue which your attorney could raise with regards to taking back a plea. Now, that being said, every case is different. There still has to be some evidence that this police officer um, would have done it in your case. Um, even if, Now, again, that's, that's a gray area that um, you have to look at. Now, you can obviously make an issue of it at trial, but if you're charged with a gun crime and your attorney has negotiated a, a deal with you, a, a deal with, with you and the DA's office, um, Keep that in mind. You realize that if you go to trial, obviously you could face a harsher, a harsher penalty. So um, whether it was an open plea or negotiated plea, it makes a difference. An open plea, remember, is where there is no negotiation between you and the DA's office and the judge sentences you based on arguments and also based on the sentencing guidelines, your offense gravity score, your prior record score. Uh, the negotiated plea is where you and your attorney work something out in advance with the DA's office, and the judge in most situations will approve that negotiated plea. This question, um, you know, knowing that you can beat the case, um, I mean, now in, with a gun charge, typically uh, what I interpret that to mean is, is that it was a bad search of some sort. Uh, and the way we deal with a bad search is a motion to suppress evidence. Keep in mind that that is a pretrial motion to suppress evidence. It is not a trial issue. Now, at trial, the evidentiary burden of proof is guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. At a motion, it's preponderance. So it's a, less of a burden. Now, obviously, uh, police officers' credibility would be a 
would be an issue at trial and at a motion. But again, there has to be evidence of that being done. Um, now, obviously, his 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 prior conduct could be an issue in and of itself with regards to credibility. But I would still want to evaluate the case to make sure that this was the proper decision, taking into account those burdens of proof, the facts in this case, and making a decision based on that. Don't just take back a plea because you think you can beat the case, especially if the attorney has negotiated what appears to be a, a solid a solid deal based on your sentencing guidelines. So I don't know if this person's sentencing guidelines are, for instance, 10 to 20 years. So if he's serving three to six and he already has you know 18 months in incarceration, well, he has 18 more months to go. But if he goes to trial and he's convicted, he's looking at 10 to 20. Well, it might not be the wisest decision. Obviously, if you're acquitted, the case is drawn out, you're going to be released. But we're not sure how long you know this case is going to go on. If he's been in jail 18 months and it's going to take another six months to get to trial and he's not, you know, again, as far as he's not denying that that this didn't happen, he's simply believing that you know he could beat the case based on some technicality, well, there's an, all these issues have to be explained to this person. And I would encourage you to speak with your lawyer and try to flush out all those issues. Okay, so that's all the questions we have this week. I want to thank you all for listening again. Like always, I want to encourage if you have a question, go to our website, um, submit the question there. If you'd like, you can always uh, do it that way. You can even text it uh, now. Um, if you like our content, you like this video, please like and subscribe. Uh, we do these every week. It's my hope that this will help you or a member of your family with a criminal case. I want to wish you and your family all the health. Uh, with this coronavirus, please uh, practice social distancing. Do what you need to do to keep you and your family safe. And I will see you next week.